Hello, bienvenue, hola, guten tag, deal with, and you are so welcome into our study hub. And we are delighted to say that we are back with Study Hub again. And this is the cosy spot for Leaving Cert students and their parents, because we know that some of you do listen in too. And the idea is so simple. Week by week, we will track down the best teachers that we can find. We go through the subjects with them and nail them to the floor to hear what their top tips and hints are to help you at home tackle the Leaving Cert exam with style. And we will try to have a few laughs along the way, I promise. Right! Let's just do this! I have English homework. You're still learning English? It's the language you speak. Over the next few weeks, we'll discuss two or three subject papers dividing between higher and ordinary level. And we'll share all of that that we can on TikTok, on Insta and on our brand new YouTube channel. So we'd love you to get in touch. Ask us anything. It's your show. This is your audio classroom and you ask me and I'll flick through my contacts book and track the answers down. So do check all that out. I'll also be joining the Drive Time team on Radio 1 on Thursday evenings to give a preview of that week's pod. So do tune in for that. But what do we have for you today? Well, English paper one with our old pal Connor Murphy who teaches in Skipperine and his explanation on how to prepare for the long form essay is a masterclass in itself. We're also joined doing music with Susan McCormick who's an assistant professor of music at Trinity College Again, another wonderful highlight. I have to say, even if you're not doing music, I think her advice applies all around for exam students. But we're going to kick off this new series with my buddy Jen Trecek from Way Ahead Therapy. Friend of the show, Jen, we're calling you at this point. Jen is here to help you think about your mental health during this time. And she's going to help us all to navigate these kind of months ahead. And... If you've ever watched the US office, you'll know that trying to de-stress, you know what, it's not always that straightforward. It is a beautiful, sunny day as we walk through the meadow that is very spiritual and relaxing and there are flowers and it is sunny and beautiful. Now, up ahead, a castle. What is that? People. Please, I told you to get rid of the cell phones. It's my biofeedback machine. Oh, okay. What is that, like a video game? It alerts me when my stress level goes up so I can try to calm down. You have stress? Yes. During our relaxation exercise? Let me get you some water. No, no, I'll help you. I'll help you. Here we go. Here we go. Michael, let me get you. you, Would you step back, please? Okay. All right. A little further. Okay. And then the stress disappears when he leaves. Let's talk about this word stress. And, you know, we know that leaving search students can feel it at this time of year. But like, what are they feeling? I mean, I think it helps to kind of name it, identify it. What does it mean to you, Jen? So I suppose when we think about stress, I think about um, it can be a physical experience, that sense in your body of your heart racing, your stomach kind of lurching, that sweating can really affect kind of sleep. Um, But also maybe your brain just feeling full, you know, feeling really lots of stuff going on and you can't kind of make sense of things or figure out a plan forward. I think that's what it can feel like. I'm really aware for these students that many of them may not have even done a junior cert. You know, the state exam, they've heard so much about it. That has to be a factor as well. Oh, I had a student yesterday who explained it. He said, I've done two years of um, junior cert and I didn't have any exams, didn't study. I had a year of TY, I didn't study, I had great fun. I had a year of fifth year not realising I had to study and now I'm in sixth year and I'm realising and the panic is starting to set in and it can feel a little bit scary um, and I know, you know that you know this week and next week the mocks are, are kicking in mm-hmm. and the reality is starting to, to set in and there's a little bit of panic um, but I think really saying to people there's still plenty of time I think that's a really key thing to remember. Now you've got some great grounding techniques I love these because this is a really practical set of tools that you can have in your back pocket for when you're having what you're talking about that feeling of panic. Talk us through what somebody can do if they can feel that little surge building up in them. Yeah and it's a really good one for when you're sitting in the exam um, space and it might be the first time for some of these students that it's the first time you've sat there and you're up in your head and you're worried about it. So it's a, a grounding is bringing us back into ourselves, into our body. So really simply, we're thinking about the five senses. So five is looking around and seeing five different things in the room that I can see. I'm orientating myself. Four is f- touching. So what can I feel? I can feel the chair underneath me, the ground. I can feel the desk. I can feel that pen in my hand. Okay. And then three, we're really Really, um, three things I can hear. So we're slowing it down. I can hear the rustling of the paper or the ticking of the clock or somebody near me breathing maybe. We're bringing it right down. 
Two is our, our sense of smell and taste. What can I can I taste my breakfast from this morning? Can I smell the perfume that I, makes me feel good about myself? And then one big deep breath. So we're bringing ourselves right down into the moment and onto the paper in front of us. Stop thinking forward, think into the present. So this is five, four, three, two, one. Just things to distract you to get you out of that little minute. Out of your head and into the moment. <sighs> I will plough on now that I have that in mind. Now, I just want to talk to you about the word motivation because there's panic, there's motivation. I think people and parents and families are in the middle of this. They don't know how much do you push, how much do you pull. It's very difficult for the household, isn't it? It's really hard. And even sometimes understanding what we mean by motivation. And I hear students saying, I'm not motivated, I can't get started studying. And I say, you know, two questions to ask. How important are these exams to you? And how confident are you that you could do it if you wanted to? And the answers to those kind of help us decide, well, what do we need to do next? So if you're very, um, you know, it's very important, I really want to do well, but I'm not confident that I can. Then we're looking at study skills, we're looking at techniques and guidance counsellors are brilliant at being able to help you to make a plan to move forward. Whereas if you're like, I could do it if I wanted, but I just can't be bothered, it's not really important. Then we're having a different conversation. We're talking about, well, what are your goals? What are your values? What's important? for your future and why are we going through this process? So those two questions, both for the student themselves um, and for parents to ask, to try and get on, uh, to understand what is the block to that motivation word. And so it's a big thing for us always here in Study Hub is we take the exams very seriously, but not too seriously. They are just exams and lots of people have done them before you. So let's learn from everybody and share so that we can get through this, navigate this, you can get out and have, you know, live the rest of your lovely life at the other side of it. But I do want to talk about the red flags and what is a red flag just to arm people to know when maybe they're a little bit in trouble here they need maybe that outside help yeah so I suppose we always look at functioning and are you doing what you need to do or you know what you have to do and if you're getting stuck so you're finding it hard to get up in the morning to get going um, if you're struggling with sleep if you find your appetite you love sleep you think I, sleep I, is good sleep for teenagers is really, <laughs> yeah. sleep's really important and a really good indicator but a good measure yeah and we've all been in that space where you know your head's buzzing and you just can't shut down or you can't shut off and and you can't sleep and that's a sign that actually you might need a bit of extra support to say to get those things out of your head and to make sense of it so sleep is a really good indicator and it, it, when we're getting good sleep our health improves generally you know we feel better in ourselves so that's really really key so go to sleep at night a few gentle stretches yeah. turn off the old screens turn off the phone at least half an hour before bed minimum get it out of the room definitely do yourself that favour and of course then listen to Study Hub that's going to help you too isn't it <laughs> to, to fall asleep to know that, I hope not <laughs> <laughs> to know that we're here to help and guide you every step of the way you're going to stay with us Jen because we're going to come back in a few minutes about other topics so that's Jen Trecek from Way Ahead Therapy any questions for Jen throw them into us and uh, I can personally call her because I have her number and get advice <laughs> for you and bring it back here. But now that we are calm and ready and in a good place, let's begin because we're going to start with one of the big beasts of the Leaving Cert. This is English Paper 1 and Connor Murphy should be on the line. Connor teaches in Skibbereen Community School. Connor, hello, how are you? Not too bad. I don't know about Paper 1 being called a beast. It's a bit unfair. The big beasts. I loved Paper 1 but that's what's under the microscope here, Connor, because this is where you get to show off all the hard work you've been doing for years but I want to start with the housekeeping question. Any changes since last year in higher level Paper 1 in particular? Anything that we need to be aware of? No changes in higher level or only level Paper 1. All the changes that were there are still there but they're all in Paper 2. OK, well, look, let's get stuck in because it is a big paper. Comprehension section. Talk us through the format here. Really talk us through what we're looking out for here that we can, you know, to help us tackle this paper. Well, one of the things students have to remember, and it's one that a lot of them forget, no matter how many times you tell them, is that there are three texts. There's an A and a B in each text. You can do a B. You, you cannot do an A and a B from the same text. So if I do a, an A from text one, then I must do a B from text two or three. That's the big one that students often forget because otherwise you're you're down 50 marks straight away. So um, that's the important one. Um, my advice would be to pick the B first because the Bs can be a little bit tricky. So pick them and then go back to the other two texts and say see which A you want to do. Now, timing recommendations here because people can get into an awful knot, can't they, when they're trying to, you know, barrage their way through a paper? There are loads of different recommendations for timing out there. So I'm just going to give you what I say to my students and they can go, whoever's listening, watching, whatever, can go to your, what, find other timers, version, that's fine. But this is just your recommendation, but go for it. This yeah. is just my recommendation. Sure. So you've got three sections. 
A, B, and the S, A. So for A, 45 minutes, B, 45 minutes, leaving about an hour and 10 minutes for the S, A, giving about five minutes to plan the S, A, and an hour and five minutes to write it. Now, having said that, that gives you 10 minutes to look over the paper, which is loads of time. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to eat back as much time as you can as you go through it. So you have lots of time to get the stuff done, but if you get it done quicker, you're giving more time to your essay. So the essay, looking over the exam might only take like five minutes. So all of a sudden you've got five more minutes. And the A1 shouldn't take that long either. Usually students can get that done in 40 and the B in 40. But the, if I, but the, the idea of giving 45 is just that little bit of breathing space so there's nobody panicking. Now, yes, and we've been dealing with panicking there and panicking is never good because it's going to muddle you a little bit. So one of the things that helps you not panic is to have choices and strategies, right? So with that in mind, let's talk about the essay. We know it's worth 100 marks. There's seven potential titles there, but they break down into sections. I mean, people can be pre-armed with this kind of stuff, can't they? Pre-armed to a point. You, you, a lot of students will go in knowing what their favourite essay is, and that's fine. Um, the short story always comes up, personal always comes up, a persuasive speech always comes up, and uh, those three always come up, and then discursive opinion pieces and sometimes a descriptive essay. So they go in and they'll know that I'm really good at writing personal essays, but then they go in there and they read the personal essays and go, oh, sh shoot, uh, <laughs> this doesn't quite suit me. So you have, to, you have to have a backup. My backup is always the persuasive speech because you can have a structure to that. You can go in with a structure, knowing the structure, knowing the persuasive techniques, all the elements you're gonna do, knowing that if you execute the structure well and include the persuasive techniques well, no matter what else happens, you're gonna do 55, 65% depending. So that's the good, the good fallback, is having the persuasive speech there ready to go. Okay, well, you have to now elaborate on this. It sounds like a great strategy. Talk us through maybe two or three techniques that people can bear in mind that'll help them nail that essay. In terms of the persuasive speech? Yeah. Well, you just make sure, what you go is, before, before the, your study for the persuasive speech is having the four, 15 to, to 20 persuasive techniques. So you have things like uh, repetition, things like rhetorical questions, uh, using adjectives. And if I can give any advice that to students, adjectives are magic in persuasive speeches. Instead of just a student, they're sensational students. You know, instead of just uh, the, the, the next pre president of the United States, the, the next uh, intellectual, for change, president of the United States. Examiners like those, so, right? They, they like it, seeing it, those in, in, terms your, of, in your writing. In your persuasive speech, they do. Now, it can, it can backfire if you're trying to use them in personal essays and they, they can be a bit, a bit over the top and a little bit uh, ridiculous. But in persuasive speeches, they're, they're, they're like magic dust. And you can go in with a, your, um, with a structure. So you can have your negative to begin with and then your positive and rallying call at the end. So you're going in with this, knowing the kind of thing you're going to write and then you're just looking for the content, depending on the exam. Now, lots of students will say they want the short story, but that is a challenge, isn't it? Is it an extra challenge? Well, a lot, of, a lot of teachers think it's an extra challenge, and I would disagree. It depends on the student. So if you go in and you, you're good at short story writing, but you just have to remember that you have to follow the instructions in, in the exam, and you have to do what the exam tells you to do. And the other thing I kind of have to remember is that they're looking for a short, a short story structure as well. So it's not, it's not a literary uh, short story they're looking for, unfortunately. They're looking for something that has a reversal, that has a reveal. But what you can take from uh, Claire Keegan, uh, for instance, is the idea of tension over drama. Um, one of the things students often look for is a bit of drama rather than looking for the tension in yes, a situation. A, a high kind of so, body count and lots of mergers and dramatic things like this. And when you think of Claire Keegan, it's the complete opposite, isn't it? The tension shows in such a different way. The complete opposite. I'll give you a very quick example, and I'm hoping the student doesn't uh, listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> A it was because it was a recent short story. I have a, I have, she's a fantastic student, like absolutely A1 student. And she wrote a brilliant first half of a short story involving an aeroplane. And, so, and the tension was rising. But then the second half, it turned into 9-11, an actual 9-11, the plane crashed and blew up. So my feedback was, you don't need the drama. You don't need the drama of having been 9-11. You can shorten it down and add tension. So instead of it being 9-11, she just wants the last chicken stuffing sandwich that the kid sit next to her has. And that's the last one in the airplane. The tension is how is she going to steal it off the little kid? <laughs> Excellent. Well, I mean, you're the expert around here. Love it. Now, the other thing I want to just uh, finally then, that good visual tip that you have for helping students again to think of this in terms of you know, being strategic in their approach to writing. 
there's there's lots of there's lots of little uh, little tips. My favorite one at the moment is having a kind of a timeline from the left to the right. So if you write down a little line, left to right, and on the left hand side you have aesthetic writing or aesthetic writing, as my students keep correcting me, and on the right hand side you have persuasive. So you're not and along the along the way there you have narration, personal opinion, discursive all okay. along there. But not you know. And then what you're thinking of, what techniques? So aesthetic writing is all poetry and uh, that kind of stuff. D d descriptive writing and persuasive is much more, much more controlled and logical and clinical. So when you're given a piece to write in the exam, you're going, how many, what techniques am I taking from anywhere across that line? So you're not narrowing it down to, oh, I must only have these and I must only have these. So it, you avoid learning off opinion pieces must have this, these 10 things. Person writers must have these 10 things. You're thinking, no. It's, a, it's a, a continuum of techniques and I'm picking and choosing which one I want. And the other big, the other big uh, tip I would have is to remember details are very important. And by that I mean, um, if you're writing a personal essay, it's the detail of the drinking rock shandy and not just drinking a, a, a mineral. Um, and that goes for uh, speeches as well. Be personal. It's not just a fella down the road. It's if we all remember Paddy the farmer down the road, who was a dairy milk in Balhadrine or something like that. Um, and my final tip, because Jen said about grounding, if you sit down and you're using her advice for the grounding, those five senses, you can now use those five senses in your essay writing as well. Oh, Jen, look at this. We're copywriting stuff here. Oh, love, connecting, it. love it. Connecting, love it. And let that, I know, but it is that thing of exchanging the information so that, you know, you write richer answers that are a little bit more original to get those marks. It's all about having that clever strategy. Connor, you're going to stay with us because we've more to discuss with you in a minute. We're getting great questions in, so don't move at all. Joining us from Cork there this evening, Connor Murphy. But we are going to move on to, I have to say, one of my favourite subjects. And I didn't even do it, but it's just you make it so wonderful. <laughs> this is uh, Dr. Susan McCormick. She's the Assistant Professor of Music Education and as I say even if you're not doing music I think Susan has great advice for you all here now busy time for students they're getting ready for practicals talk us through the kind of performance practice rehearsal that they should be doing right now yeah so the practicals this year are taking place the two weeks after Easter which is welcome which is very welcome yeah, yeah for teachers and students alike I think and really what students should be doing now is lots of very focused practice so they sit down and they make the most of their practice time they have a very clear goal and um, and they, they're going to achieve that goal in a short amount of time and as, as focused amount of time as possible. Because it's worth 50%. I mean, the yeah. practical is so serious, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, it can be worth 50%. Yeah. The majority of the country will do 50% for, for practical. And it's a huge amount of marks. Mm. Um, now, the thing is, is that examiners will want to give those marks. You know, it's actually a beautiful exam. The examiners want to sit back and be entertained. So if we kind of approach it in that way, what are the elements of the performance that I really want to bring across here? So it's the communication. It's the obviously the knowledge and the technique is there as well. But mm -hmm. that communication piece is really important. So it's like don't bolt in, terrified, stand in the corner, play your instrument or whatever and yeah. run out the door. Try and communicate through the music. Absolutely. Okay. And performance techniques in terms of performing in front of others, that's going to be really useful as well. The more you do that, the easier it becomes. OK, so you have that maybe hopefully in yes. the bag in the next couple of weeks and then we get to the exam as mm -hmm. such, right? Now we hear about this, the listening element, for example, and how important that is yeah. for music students. Again, how do you prepare for listening, though? I mean, it seems like an odd thing to try and study for. Yeah, because this, the listening exam is a six question exam and students go into it and often we forget that it's a listening exam. We're so focused in reading the questions and mm. trying to remember, oh, what was that instrument that my teacher told me that day? Rather than actually remembering it is a listening exam. <laughs> open our eyes, our ears and listen. You know, we're trying to respond to what we hear. And so from now into the exam, if we can encourage and develop our aural skills on the daily, you're really going to see a huge improvement. Now, obviously, familiarity with your set works and so on will help. Sure. But listening in the car and the to the radio, to your iPod, whatever it is. You happen to hear a bit of a theme tune from yeah. the TV bursting across the sitting room. That's a useful minute for you Absolutely. to pause and analyse. What you is that music switch on your active okay. listening skills and you say, what instrument is that? Okay. Let's tap along to the beat. I wonder, can I establish... A random the, the ad, music might hear on TikTok, Absolutely, whatever. Absolutely, yeah. I wonder what the texture is in that. Let's see how many melodic lines do I hear. This is all really, really, really beneficial and it's going to help you to do as well as you can on the day. Now, the prescribed music is just absolutely beautiful, as we know. And I think we're going to indulge ourselves for a quick minute. I think we have some Tchaikovsky lined up. Just set the tone for Lovely. the season.
Oh, what a joy when you're doing the Leaving Cert to have that as part of your soundtrack. This brings us nicely into the composition question. Again, we always get questions around composition. People are daunted by it. Yeah. What can they do to help unlock it a little bit for them? So a couple of things here. First of all, practice makes perfect for composition, but feedback and the element of feedback is really, really important. Students need to know what is expected of them. And I suppose the marking scheme is a little elusive in places. And so we need to understand what we are trying to achieve. And most students will do question one, which is continuation of a given opening. And when you're looking at that question, we want to think broadly about the question, what are we trying to achieve here? We're trying to create a melody that is connected to the given opening. We want it to sound like the same person has composed the whole thing. But we also want shape and we want a sense of structure and we want a sense of climax. I'm just listening to that, to the Tchaikovsky Mm. moment there where we're building up to the climatic moment. We need that too in our melodies. So I have provided a little video which breaks down the marking scheme which may be useful. And then when it comes to the harmony question, it's a 60 mark question. It is worth more than all four of our set works put together. And the great... Say that again? Yeah, it's 60 marks. So the set works are 55 marks in total. So take it so seriously. Yeah. Yeah. And the great thing about the harmony question is that you actually can do really well the examiners really do give you the marks if you if if yes. you deserve them. I'm not sure that I can say the same always for the melody, but for the harmony, you can get the marks if you approach it in a very systematic way. And with the composition paper, in my opinion, it is so valuable that you spend time preparing. So don't just go in, pick your question, sit down and start writing. Mm-hmm. Prepare. Take five or ten minutes to prepare each question. Do it in a systematic, structured way. And I promise you, it will result in a much higher quality answer. Now, as Leaving Cert students, you know, as they're getting closer to the exams, there's always the ones who think they've cracked the code and that they really are a bit like Bach. And we don't, just, you know, <laughs> you know, we have a little bit of Bach here in the background. We're just going to fade up here to set the scene for us about what people can achieve in this arena. That was some of Bach's Cantata 78, the seventh movement. So this is an example of the kind of music that students are immersing themselves mm. in. But what I'm hearing from you now is there's the list and then there's the outside world and let both inform each other in as the musician sits down to answer the paper. Absolutely. Our skills are developed no matter what genre of music you're listening to. There are certainly genres that are maybe a little bit more complex. And for example, we just listened to the seventh movement of Bach. The first movement is quite a bit more complex because it's contrapuntal and polyphonic. So your ear is trying to go, oh, will I listen to that line or mm. will I listen to mm. that line? And it might be might be torn between different lines. Um, so there are certainly more complex uh, pieces of work to listen to. But if you develop and practice your aural skills, treat it like developing and building a muscle, it will improve and it will really stand to you. Now, thank you so much. Uh, and Susan says she's already given us some wonderful music videos uh, exclusively for us on our site there, uh, hosted by RTE Learn. So please go on there where we have all of our additional resources as well. But Susan's videos, her music videos are there. Now, we've held on to Connor. I hope he's still with us. Jen is with us still in studio as well, because we've been inviting you to steer this conversation with our hashtag Ask Me Anything on our socials. We've great stuff coming in on this. But I want to dive in. And Connor, maybe you'd have something on this, which is, you know, we know there's been this huge increase in the use of AI and chat GBT right across the board but when it comes to school and college writing anecdotally students said to be using it you know to help for practice essays what is the point of this do you see any point of it what's your kind of steer on it what's your response to it there is no point in using AI in an English classroom <laughs> in the Leaving Cert it's, count- wow, that's it's clear. counterproductive Okay. It's counterproductive. There's, there's no point me giving you 80%. I'm not, I'm not, you know, <laughs> I'm not the leaving cert. I'm just Connor Murphy who teaches down in Skip. It'd be kind of like uh, Jack Crowley getting a robot to do the practice penalty kicks for him. <laughs> and then on the big day, he has to step up and do them himself. All of a sudden, he's going, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> I'm again? sure there are days. Are you there's love it, yeah. no point. But yeah, so your no point, point is what? It just, it's, it's not a tool. It's, counter, it's counterproductive. Uh, you, you are there to learn how to write and develop your writing and, and find your voice as well. So if you value your own voice even, you should, you should be pushing AI away. Um, but it's also counterproductive because AI isn't going to be sitting next to you in the exam. You're going to be sitting there on your own and you won't be able to you know, put it into ChatGBT. Now, I'm sure there are ways for it to help gather notes and other, other fantastic elements. But in terms of 
actually writing an essay for you, uh, I'd be, I, I would, I would count, uh, I would advise strongly against it. So even if I say to you, I just did it as a practice to see what it'll come up with, and then I read it and I pulled it apart and I've learned from that experience. You're backing away from that, I feel. I'd back away from that. I'd back away from that. I would, I, if you want to, if the student wants to put it into AI and bring it, give it to me and Mr. Murphy will go through this in the class and, and you know, yeah. what's good about it and what's not good about it. I will, I will go through that as well. But if you, if, but you're, you're, you're denying, for me, and yes. this is the old English teacher coming out, the old, God be Gara, poor old Conor <laughs> Murphy. But if you're using it to try and help your writing, you're yes. going the wrong way. I want you, the student, to develop your voice and your way of writing and your way of speaking, your way of communicating. I don't want a robot helping you. I want to just, you know, let a human help you do that. So avoid the way. temptation of that. And robots, as we were saying, Jack Crowley, you've the example there. But, you know, there may be a day they'll play the instruments first, but not yet, Susan. <laughs> so again, in your world, for your students preparing, you know, saying, oh, look, I'm running through answers, I'm getting ideas. What's your own advice around that? Because it does feel like it's coming. Yeah, I just can't see it being useful for the music paper, at least. I mean, if, if we So you'd be saying no to students right now for yeah, using it? Okay. I suppose there's an essay question and there's a composition question. Mm. They'd be the two elements that potentially AI could play a role in. Sure. But uh, for the essay question, you need examples. And AI, as far as I can tell, at least will mm. not be able to come up with those specific exam- examples <coughs> that will directly respond to yeah. the essay questions. And then for composition, again, you're going to come up with an answer that is completely disconnected from the given opening, which will result in very low marks. Jen, I'm now throwing the ball over to you. I'm interested because you're having conversations with students about all this. This sense of using it, maybe out of panic, maybe because somebody thinks they've fallen behind and it's a resource. We all use the resources that we can and the tools that we can. What's your own feeling on it? Yeah, that kind of last minute, oh, I'll just use it this time yeah. to get me over the line. But then once you start down that road, what about the Very next hard time? To stop. And the next time. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I suppose it might give you, you know, in the moment you get a, a good grade because you've used AI and that feels really good momentarily. But you don't have the satisfaction of knowing that actually I earned that grade. I put in the work and I know I can do it myself. Um, when you have technology that's doing it for you, you're not really testing yourself and, and seeing, you know, how much you can actually do. And, how much and you, you do tried actually. out something. You did a little experiment yourself. I tried ChatGPT just to, I asked it to write me an essay um, including references and it gave me a beautiful essay and interesting references and I asked for the specific authors of the journal articles and actually all of the references it gave me were fake they didn't exist. I looked through all of the different databases and those references didn't exist so not really real not really real. Connor. thank you so much for that advice from Cork. Thank you so much uh, Susan McCormick and indeed Jen. Uh, we're going to keep all your numbers on my speed dial. I'll be back to all of you. But that is our lot for week one. Follow us on all our socials. You can watch this entire podcast back on Archie's YouTube channel. Also, we are linking in with RTE Learn. Everything is there. Susan's videos are there. Everything. A load of extra content, supports, ideas and resources. So go rate it. And the best thing about all of this, in my view, is that it's all for free. So knock yourself out. I've been Evelyn O'Rourke. That has been Study Hub week one next episode we get stuck into maths ordinary level paper one French and biology but until then slog of old